Thank you very much. Is this on or is this Okay, good. Um, I, I know he just introduced me, so let me just see if I can reintroduce myself here with a few maybe other things. Uh, he did mention, well, I think he mentioned that I, I led the research that discovered human telomerase at Geron Corporation back in the mid-1990s. Um, I was awarded second place for United States or National Inventor of the Year for that. Um, I've been a telomere biologist for 19 years now, and <clears throat> I've been in biotech for 31 years focusing, before I got into telomere biology, I was focused on cancer research, uh, heart disease research, and inflammation research at, at a few biotech companies. I'm presently on 43 U.S. issued patents on telomerase, which is more than anybody else in the world. Uh, so I've, my, my life has become pretty much telomeres and telomerase. Uh, I'm the founder, president, CEO of Sierra Sciences, as was just mentioned, a company that's totally focused on trying to figure out ways of protecting and lengthening our telomeres. And my work and my company and my, myself have been featured recently in Popular Science, The Today Show, and a few other documentaries and stuff like that, if you can find them. Okay, so in the past, I've focused my talks on telomere biology and aging. But we now know that aging is, is, or telomere biology is way more than just aging. And so I'd like to introduce a new subject today, and that's short telomere disease. This is now what my focus is on. It covers a lot more than just aging. And <clears throat> I believe that short telomere disease, or short telomeres, are the number one health risk in humans right now. As you'll see when I talk later, it affects just about everything in our, in our bodies, and the thing we don't want is we don't want short telomeres. So the title of my talk is Bad Things Happen When Telomeres Get Short. We do not want short telomeres. Okay, so first, I know a lot of people here are new, I've heard, so uh, you haven't seen this talk before, so I'm gonna be going over some basics, but. The first thing I want to do is just make certain that everybody here knows what a telomere. I did meet one person already that didn't know what it was. So what is this word telomere? And so to explain what a telomere is, we need to zoom in on a human uh, being, human body. And when we do so, we find out that a human's made up of 100 trillion cells. And most theories about why we age say that we age because our cells age. So that's where we want to work. We want to find a way to intervene and figure out ways of preventing the aging and the decline of health. Now, if we zoom in any further, we find that every cell contains a nucleus. Inside these nuclei are found the chromosomes, that, you know, where our genes are that give us our hair color, eye color, and everything like that. But if we zoom in on one chromosome, we're getting deeper and deeper inside the cell. We find that a See if I can get the pointer pointing here. A chromosome is made up of two arms. Each contains a DNA molecule. And I guess, the, I guess I'm not going to be able to use the pointers from here. Okay, so an arm extends from left to right. There's two arms here extended left to right. And inside each arm is a very long DNA molecule, about 100 million bases in length. DNA is measured in units of bases. Now, the DNA to fit inside this chromosome is coiled up like a slinky. So it goes from one end all the way to the other. <clears throat> now, the key is, remember, we're, we're trying to figure out what a telomere is. And a telomere is the very tips of this chromosome, shown here in yellow. Now, if we unwind that slinky that makes up the telomere, we find that a telomere, the slide didn't move forward, we find that a telomere is about 15,000 bases in length. Remember, a chromosome is 100 million bases in length. Telomere is only about 15,000 bases in length. So it's pretty small. It's like, it's, a chromosome is like a shoelace, and the caps of your shoelaces are like the telomeres. Okay, so it's 15,000 bases, at least when we're first conceived. But then as our cells start to divide, our telomeres start to shorten. And by the time we are become, have enough cell division to become a newborn baby, our telomeres have shortened already 5,000 bases. So our telomeres are now 10,000 bases long when we're born. Right, as we develop even further, our telomeres shorten further and further and further as our cells divide. 
And by the time they get down to 5,000 bases, we die of old age. Well, let me go over that again. We're conceived at 15,000 bases, we're born at 10,000 bases, and we die of old age at 5,000 bases. In a petri dish, human cells cannot function when the telomeres get below 5,000 bases. They go through a slow, short period of senescence and then eventually die. <clears throat> this is true in the human body. We, we find that telomeres, when they get down to 5,000 bases, don't function anymore. They won't divide, your skin gets thin, etc. Now there's also a theoretical maximum lifespan that several papers have calculated to be about 125 years. And nobody's ever been able to explain it. But this clock, this clock of aging here, fairly accurately explains it. <clears throat> and the problem is, until now and recently, there's been absolutely nothing we can do about this. This clock is shortening every time a cell divides, no matter how well we eat, no matter how much we exercise, and no matter how much we do everything you're, you tell yourself to do and you tell your patients to do. All right, so it's something that we really have no control over. I want to, this whole field was pioneered by the Nobel Prize winners, who I want to congratulate, Elizabeth Blackburn, Carol Greider, and Jack Stosak. They won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for elucidating this entire process of telomere shortening. <clears throat> now the question is, now, the second part of my introduction here, is why do telomeres shorten? All right, so it seems like an awful thing to have happen. What's going on here? Now, I will show you that it's actually something that, that is not a process of where something's degrading away. It's a process of, it's a lack of a process, and that's why we have it. But to explain this, let me use an analogy. Pretend that a DNA molecule inside of a cell is the top layer of bricks on a brick wall. And so when a cell wants to divide, it first needs to, make a copy of that top row of bricks so that each new cell will have a similar copy. So inside the cell, we have a brick layer. Now inside the cell, the brick layer likes to stand on top of this wall, moving backward, laying a brick each time. <clears throat> and remember, this is a very long, tedious process. This DNA is like 100 million bases. So it goes on and on and on. And you know we don't want any errors because that will lead to mutations. All right, so now, well, of course, what we're interested in right now is what's going on at the very tip of the chromosome, the telomere. And so when this brick layer gets here, you're going to find that there's an unfortunate choice of standing on top of the wall. And that's that the brick layer cannot lay a brick in the very last place that the brick layer was standing. Now, this is typical of what happens inside of a cell. Polymerase, DNA polymerase 1 replicating the DNA cannot replicate the very tip of the chromosome. As a result, when it falls off, it has left the last end of the chromosome unreplicated. Okay, so now the cell is going to divide again. <clears throat> the cell is going to divide again, and again, the brick layer is going to be falling off the end of this wall. And as a result, the telomere is going to even be shorter. So every time the cell divides, it gets shorter and shorter. And again, there's absolutely nothing we can do about this. You can see, no matter what we do, can't eat, exercise, nothing's going to fill in that missing brick. So, so nothing we can do about it. Now there's things we can do to accelerate this. Okay, you can't slow it down, but you can sure accelerate it. And that's anything related to an unhealthy lifestyle, like obesity, lack of exercise, psychological stress, or smoking. All these things would generate free radicals or induced inflammation, which will cause accelerated telomere shortening. None of us want that. But there are things we can do about that. We can quit smoking, we can lose weight, we can meditate, <clears throat> and we can, what was the other one? Uh, lose weight, meditate, whatever. Okay, so there's, there's all kinds of things we can do to improve our lifestyle to, to decrease this accelerated telomere shorting. <clears throat> the first, so this is I call accelerated telomere shorting. The very first thing that I showed you I call basal level telomere shorting, the one we can't do anything about, and which is what research is doing right now to try to find a way to do, a, to do something about. Now the best evidence that the telomere shorting actually does affect poor health and aging is that some people are born with short telomeres. 
And this disease called progeria is a short telomere disease. Now, some people have heard that uh, these people, these kids, actually suffer from a mutation called lamin A. Well, that's true. It turns out, though, that a lot of publications now have shown that the lamin A mutation is actually the cause of the short telomeres. But the short telomeres cause these kids to suffer from all the age-related ailments that normal old people do. They, you know, everything. And so <clears throat> they die of old age at approximately 20 years old. And if we could figure out a way to prevent this telomere shortening, this could be a cure for this, for this disease. And so wouldn't that be wonderful? But this isn't the, oh, so bad things happen when telomeres get short. And this is a key example of that's the case. But it's not just these kids that suffer from it. We suffer from, this isn't working. We suffer from telomere shortening in practically every aspect of human health. There's been thousands and thousands of publications now showing, since we discovered telomerase, uh, in this whole process, there's been thousands of papers showing that practically every disease we know of is affected by the length of our telomeres. As I said before, I call this the number one health risk in humans right now. Everything you can see on this list, and the list is like 10 times longer than this, has been shown to be affected by telomeres in peer-reviewed scientific publications. It includes cardiovascular disease, cancer, COPD, uh, on and on and on. Cancer, we've all heard about cancer in terms of telomere biology and telomerase. It used to be thought that keeping the telomeres long, turning on this enzyme telomerase, which I'll be talking about shortly, would cause cancer. Well, it's been about seven, eight years since there's been a single publication now saying this. And in fact, now all the publications are saying that short telomeres will cause cancer. And so we want to keep our telomeres long. And short telomeres will also interfere with our immune... So short telomeres will cause, when, just like on a shoelace, when, it, when the caps get short, the shoelace starts to fall apart. Chromosomes fall apart the same way. There's chromosome, chromosome rearrangements and mutations that lead to cancer. But also in our immune cells, the immune cells, when the immune cells, telomeres in the immune cells get short, they lose the ability to fight the cancer. And so, you know, when we get older and older, we get a lot more short telomeres in our immune cells. So we can keep the telomeres long in our immune cells. We will increase our ability to fight cancer. And if we can keep telomeres long in all of our cells, we'll decrease the risk of actually getting cancer. So <clears throat> now I'm, okay, so again, bad things happen when telomeres get short. The key message that I want to say, there's nothing good about a short telomere. There's all kinds of things great about long telomeres. Now, I'm not an MD, and so if anybody wants a lot of details about these diseases and their association with uh, telomeres, I recommend that you talk to Dr. Dave. Uh, he is somebody whose practice has become almost completely focused on telomere biology, and he is an MD. And <clears throat> the next I want to go to the fact that in 1971, Nixon declared the war on cancer. And I think that telomere, short telomere disease is much worse than cancer. And that's partly because short telomere disease is a major cause of cancer. But it causes a lot, lot more than just cancer. It causes every disease that I was just showing and, and then some. And so I'm, I'm declaring a war on short telomere disease. And I think this is, as I said, number one health risk in humans. It's something that we really have to get a handle on. And the world really doesn't even know this yet. Okay? Every, it's just a thing going on that people are bare, barely just learning about. Three years ago at a conference like this, nobody knew what a telomere was. Now, I'm glad to say that if I took a raise of hand, maybe one or two people here would, would not know what it was before today. So to get this started, the governor of Nevada governor of Nevada recently made a proclamation declaring that September 2nd to 8th is telomere research week. So he even here in Las Vegas. So he celebrates September 2nd to 8th, uh, telomere, uh, uh, September 2nd to 8th next year and do your part to fight telomere, uh, short telomere disease. Okay, so what can we do to now prevent the telomere shortening or to do about telomere shortening? And the first thing that I want to suggest is that Everybody should know the length of their telomeres. As you'll see, there's a lot we can do about it. Okay? But I think the most important thing 
first is to know the length of it. So if you have short telomeres, you'll become a little more focused on doing something about it. Well, when you look at telomeres, and when you look at telomeres, and I'll go a little bit over how this is done later in a few minutes, you find that the younger people have longer telomeres than the older people. And you see a pretty much of a straight line. So the x-axis on here is age in years, and the y-axis is the telomere length measured in uh, thousands of bases. So there'd be 10,000 bases at the top and 2,000 bases near the bottom. Okay, so it's a linear line. Okay, so now when you measure telomeres, the, let's say you're looking at a 50-year-old person. Well, there, first of all, we call that a normal line. But the 50-year-old person, would we, you'd typically find that their telomere lengths are right where it should be, right in the middle of that line at about 7,000 bases. Okay, now if you have a person who has a telomeric age less than a chronological age, you're going to find that the telomeres are actually longer for that 50-year-old than they should be. Now, a lot of people call this biological age. <clears throat> um, and I think that's wrong because we don't know enough about telomere biology yet to actually say 100% certain if telomere biology is a good correlation to biological age. So I'm calling it telomeric age instead of biological age here. But a telomeric age, if you have a telomeric age that's better than your chronological age, that's good news. Okay, but now a lot of people will have telomeric age that's greater than their chronological age, and therefore their telomeres will be shorter. You don't want that. Uh, accelerated aging diseases like the smoking and, and obesity and things like that, that's going to cause you to look something like this when you're 30 years old. You're going to have telomeres the length of a 50-year-old. This is progeria. Progerias have telomeres very, very short at a very young age. This is the most drastic case of telomere shortening. And then this is where we'd all hope to be when we're 90 years old, 85, 90 years old. We want telomeres really high, really long, because we're going to be really healthy and, and look better and feel better, etc. So this is where we always want to be, and this is where we don't want to be, because that's dead. Okay, That is like when your telomeres are just around 5,000 bases, your, your cells lose the ability to function and your, your cells can't survive. So there's five different methods of measuring telomeres right now that I know of. And most of them, all, well, all of them focus on measuring telomere lengths in the blood. But since a lot of people, a lot of anti-aging doctors, et cetera, I know we're not supposed to use anti-aging at this conference, so I apologize. Uh, but we, we know, we, we feel that the number one cause of aging is actually a weakened immune system. So blood is a really good place to be looking at telomere lengths if you want to look at an overall health of a person. But you can, all these things will allow you to look at telomeres elsewhere. But just draw about 5, 10 mils of blood, and you can then uh, get the telomere lengths measured. Now, most of these, or all of these, will look at the average telomere lengths inside of a body, inside of your cells. You have telomeres of various lengths all the time, and so you always have to look at the average telomere length. <clears throat> but two of these protocols, these bottom two, they look at the short telomeres. This is, well, let, let's go through these. There's a terminal restriction fragment called TRF. There's qPCR, fluorescence in situ hybridization called FISH. There's also flow FISH. And then the two things that measure short telomeres are H, high throughput, HTQ FISH, and universal Stella. Okay, now of all these protocols, there's three of these that are commercially available right now, where you can actually send blood samples off to get your patient's telomeres measured. And at least one of them, number five, does look at the short telomeres. <clears throat> so let's, let's discuss a little some problems with measuring telomere lengths. If you take human cells and grow them in a Petri dish, and this is like the Y X axis here is called PDL, which means population doubling level. It's a, really the number of cell divisions that the human cells are growing in a petri dish. You look at the telomere length, you find that there's a pretty fairly straight line. This, this is it's always it's a fairly straight line when you're looking at human cells in a petri dish. And occasionally you'll do a big study of people, and you'll find you get a fairly straight line there too. But unfortunately, what usually happens is you get something like this. You, if you've read a lot of telomere papers, you find they'll, they'll show those big dots all over the place, and then they fit some line showing that it's actually decreasing. Well, it is statistically significant a little bit, but usually 
that doesn't excite me very much, seeing something like that. But it doesn't discourage me either because I know that the reason why this has got a lot of scatter isn't necessarily because the telomeres are really just have nothing to do with anything. There's, <clears throat> there is a weak correlation between telomere length and at least average telomere length and uh, uh, age and overall health. <clears throat> and these are partially due to the fact that people are born with different telomere lengths. There's, there's genes that affect the genetics of telomere length, and so some families have longer telomere lengths than others. So when you're doing a population study, you're going to find that's going to add a lot of variation all by itself. Now, remember, telomeres with at least the basal level, tel basal level telomere shortening occurs every time a cell divides. Well, if somebody has cells dividing a lot faster than somebody else, of course, they're going to have different telomere lengths. So that's another cause for variation. Different environmental factors. Okay, so uh, environment does cause the generation of free radicals and inflammation. And, and, of course, that's going to cause some people to have more accelerated telomere shortening than others. So there's a lot of things that cause variation. And then my favorite really is poor signal detectability. These, these tests, most of these tests that are done, really aren't that accurate. Okay? It's really hard to take blood from a, sample, a person and then measure the telomere, especially when there's so many different telomere lengths to begin with. You can take several different blood samples from the same person and get different answers. This is sometimes why people will say, uh, oh, I had telomere measurement one day one, and then three months later I had it measured again, and my telomeres are longer, which is really exciting. Well, 50% of the people just have that just by chance because of variability. 50% have it the other way around. They see a shorter telomeres, and they get discouraged by it. But <clears throat> there is the, the, the telomere length measurement procedures aren't that good right now. With the, well, so let's say that they are, they are good for large population studies. And so if you get 1,000 people, you can see the, the change decrease in something uh, relative to some type of treatment that they're being treated with. Or if you are looking for somebody that has perjuria, you can definitely see it in an individual. You can see major differences from expectations by, by using any of these procedures. But I think the exception might be the abundance of short telomeres. So looking, so I would recommend that the best way right now to be having to looking at telomere lengths in your patients is not to be looking at the average telomere lengths, but look at the abundance of short telomeres. <clears throat> and this is like, here's, here's a case of where the top two telomeres, uh, let's say a person has long telomeres, and then after a few years, they're a little bit shorter. Well, there's not, it's pretty hard to tell the difference between those top two lines because they're both very long, one's just a little bit shorter. But when, you, when you're looking at just the short telomeres and there's a small change, it's a lot more noticeable because the small, the, like in the bottom two telomeres, uh, after there's been a little bit of shortening, the telomere is about half the length as it was before. So you can tell that difference, even though it's still a small difference, you can tell small from small. And what I'm saying is that small differences are easier to detect when you look at just the, small, the short telomeres. And so there is, there is one company, at least, that is looking at this, and this is what I recommend, is that people look at the abundance of short telomeres. And th this, is, this is what I think you can get the be most accurate answers with. So that was the first thing, is, is knowing the length of your telomeres. The second thing is, what can we do to decrease the rate of our telomere shortening? And there's a lot, as I said before. This is why you want to know the length of your telomere, because there's a lot you can do. And first, let's talk about exercise. Now I'll be getting into a lot of peer-reviewed journal articles and data and stuff like that. But exercise is one of my favorite approaches. I think the number one best thing you can do is get your patients to exercise. This is a study done in Germany <clears throat> where they looked at, at the bottom axis. There is young and there's young athletes and aged athletes. And then there's, there's young controls, so the people that don't exercise versus people that do exercise. So you see, and then the y-axis is, again, telomere length. And then this time, this time they're looking at the granulocytes of the, of the blood. And you can see that with young, unathletic people and athletic people, the telomeres are pretty much the same length. But as the person starts to get older, we go over to the right side of this graph, we see that the uh, old sedentary people that aren't exercising actually have a lot shorter telomeres. But the people that actually do exercise have longer telomeres. 
And when I do a rough calculation on the math, this is pretty much saying if, if we can say that telomeric aging or size has anything to do with what your expected increase in lifespan is, this correlates to about four years of additional lifespan from doing all this exercise. The same study looked at the lymphocytes and they got the exact same results, which is kind of good and you know, good uh, P-scores here too. Uh, they're seeing that the aged athletes, the controls have long, short telomeres and the uh, aged athletes have long telomeres. Now these, these are large population studies and they were looking at average telomere lengths, but it was good enough to be able to see that here. Another study out of Colorado, <clears throat> La Roca et al. And I've got the references on the bottom here and I'm, I'm going to tell you more about references for all these studies towards the end of my talk. Uh, again, this is a totally separate study. Young uh, sedentary versus uh, young exercise, you see that they pretty much have the same telomere lengths. This is now looking at the graph on the left side. But older people, sedentary people, have shorter telomeres than older people that exercise. We look over on the right, we see that even VO2 max correlates with telomere lengths. Uh, now, is the VO2 max better because of all the exercise or vice versa? I, the paper doesn't really address that. But it does show a correlation between good health and longer telomeres. One other study um, is a study where they looked at people doing various amounts of physical activity and leisure time. It turns out when the same kind of study was done looking at people that have jobs where they do a lot of exercise, it had no effect on their telomere lengths. Okay? It's almost got to be something where you're actually doing it intentionally, exercise. Okay, but here's inactive, light, moderate, and heavy exercise. You're seeing that the telomere lengths increase with the more exercise you do. Okay, again, this is uh, at looking approximately like maybe in a, a four-year increase in lifespan if telomeric aging really does correlate with lifespan. Okay, so next thing is stress. <clears throat> oh, and before I, I want to mention in, in exercise that if you take a mouse and put them and put a mouse on a treadmill and exercise it a lot, you're going to find out that it accelerates its aging and it dies earlier of old age. But humans aren't mice. Okay, in a lot of the studies, and I have references for those I'll show you at the end, there's been studies now shown that when a human exercises, they actually increase their level of antioxidants. They, they, they do get increased in free radicals, but their level of antioxidants increase even more. So their net result is that they get a decrease in oxidative stress from exercising all the time. Now, the person who goes out and exercises once, they're going to get a lot of oxidative stress. But a person who exercises all the time is going to find that they're going to have a decreased oxidative stress as long as they continue exercising. Well, let's go to stress now. <clears throat> stress has been shown to be correlated a lot with telomere length. And, and there's no question about the cause and effect here. This, this is the stress is causing the telomere shortening. This, and this is a good example of this right here. Caregivers of Alzheimer's patients. We're not talking about the Alzheimer's patients themselves. We're talking about the caregivers. The caregivers have shorter telomeres than their friends of the same age that aren't taking care of some sick person. Okay, so this is saying that the stress of taking care of an Alzheimer's person is causing the telomeres to be shorter in these people. Here's another study, it's a totally separate study, showing the exact same thing. The uh, number of years of being a caregiver and telomere length, again, is showing a decrease. A little bit of scatter in the data, but it's still statistically significant decrease in telomere length. Uh, child abuse has also been shown. So people that were abused as children were later got, got together and their telomeres were measured and compared to other people their same age that, weren't, that didn't go through child abuse. Again, you can see over on the right side, the telomeres are shorter for the children that have been maltreated as when they were young, or now they're adults, but they were they're, they're shorter when they were, if they'd been maltreated as being young than kids that weren't, or than people that weren't when they were kids. So stress is another thing that has been shown to be, uh, that causes telomere shortening. Depression has been shown to cause telomere shortening. This is now a graph showing the control on the far left. Again, all my graphs are, the y-axis is telomere length, and the bottom ones are the different variables being tested. This is showing, and of course, again, a lot of scatter because average telomere length is being looked at here. But with a lot of data, you can use the data. You can get something out of the data. You can see that there's the average telomere length of the control group is somewhere 
I'd say around 8,000 bases there. But all mood disorders, major depressive disorder, bipolar with anxiety or no anxiety, all of them have shorter telomeres. So what's seen in all these cases is that the telomeres and people that are suffering from psychological uh, disorders and stuff like that have shorter telomeres. There is now here questions of cause and effect in this case, but still there's a correlation between telomere length and psychological disorder. Obesity, diet, antioxidants, and smoking. Um, <clears throat> all these things cause telomere shortening. This is now a chart. This is now a little bit different. Uh, for those of you that don't know what a z-score is along the y-axis, a z-score is telling how different you are from the average or from the mean. So if you have a negative score, that means you have lower values for your, let's say in this case, it's the length of your telomeres. Your telomeres are lower than the average population. And to the right, they're higher than the average population. Well, you can see the top four good, are good things for you. Whole grain, cereal, fiber, fiber, vitamin E, and antioxidant. Uh, people who take these regularly ended up having longer telomeres. Now, people that you know, weren't taking these, they're taking the polyunsaturated fatty acids, they were, they were heavy, they had high BMIs and stuff like that. They're, you're seeing here that their telomeres were actually a lot shorter. So all these things, it, it's coming down to everything about bad lifestyles are causing short telomeres. Okay, so here's another, uh, another separate data just looking at obesity and smoking. You can see a decrease in the, you know, as BMI goes up, you see a decrease in telomeres. On the top left, in the, on the top right, you see that the, uh, with uh, serum leptin, which is really high in people that are obese, you see that their telomeres are shorter with the higher their, their serum leptin. Smoking, again, we see the, sm the more you smoke or the more packs per day you smoke, uh, your telomeres are shorter accordingly. Uh, here's another separate study on smoking showing, again, a decrease in telomere length uh, given the number of years you've smoked. Omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, this is something that's been very exciting in terms of people who have higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids, usually as a result of taking more omega-3 fatty acids, have been shown to have longer telomeres. You can see here that the uh, uh, over on the left-hand side is, is people that were taking very little omega-3 fatty acids on the right, people that had very high levels of omega-3 fatty acids, and we see an increase in telomere length. These are a lot of data here correlating telomere length to all kinds of different things. And I'm just going through one after another. Again, the difference here amounts to about four years of telomeric aging. Vitamin D. Okay, so this is a case where different groups of people at different levels of vitamin D were looked at. And again, the higher the, your levels of vitamin D, the, the longer your telomeres. I think if they'd kept on going, they might have seen that decrease eventually, but not in this particular study. Again, p-values are pretty good. Attitude, just your whole perspective on life, just who you are. People, people here, this is now, uh, people were asked questions about how old do they feel. Well, of course, now there's a real problem with cause and effect, but still, the data shows that, that if they felt old, their telomeres said they were old. Uh, and this has got a p-value of about only 0.02, but it's, 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 it's another piece of data saying that even our attitude the way we think about ourselves can affect our telomere lengths. And one really surprising bit, bit of data that I personally have no explanation for is pessimism. There has been actual publication now showing that people that are pessimistic actually have shorter telomeres than people that aren't pessimistic. And uh, I don't know how to explain that one. But it's, it's just a lot of different things now. A lot of publications are coming out, thousands, showing that different lifestyle changes, different lifestyle behaviors, different diets, etc affect the length of our telomeres. So this is a summary of everything I just said. Exercise, antioxidants, omega-3s, vitamin Ds, all those things will help keep your telomeres long. So if you measure your telomeres and you find you have short telomeres, do all these things. And also quit smoking, don't be obese, reduce your stress, reduce depression, quit being pessimistic. But, but overall, what it comes down to is just be happy. Okay? It's, it seems like the happier you are, the longer your telomeres are going to be. Now, one surprising new result that I haven't included in the slides is that household income has now been shown to be correlated with telomere length. The higher your household income is, the longer your telomeres are. And, uh, I mean, 
I can understand that why that would make people happy. Um, but uh, it's, it's, everything is it's, it's amazing how much telomeres are playing a role in our lives. And most of us didn't even know about this five, ten years ago. All right, so now I want to go to the, what I consider the most exciting part of the talk, and that's how we can increase the length of the telomeres. And the best way, and probably the only way really to do that, is through this enzyme telomerase, which I mentioned at the beginning. I led the research that discovered human telomerase at Geron Corporation. In this picture, we see <coughs> a green, squ <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, green squiggly line. That's DNA, now shown as a double helix. And this factory-looking thing is the enzyme telomerase. And what it's doing is it's bound to the end of the chromosome, lengthening the chromosome. But this enzyme's only found in our reproductive cells. It's the reason why, when even though our reproduction requires cell division, it's the reason why our children are born with longer telomeres than we have, or the, the same length as what we had when we were first born. It's because in our reproductive cells, this enzyme telomerase produces it lengthens the telomeres. So every time the clock ticks, one tick, telomerase uh, relengthens it, pushes the tick back. So as a result, during cell division in our reproductive cells, there is no telomere shortening. And this is how we ended up discovering telomerase, through this, this knowledge, is, is asking what's going on? Why don't telomeres shorten in our reproductive cells? So using the bricklayer analogy, let's go back here and, and and see what telomerase is actually doing. The bricklayer is still going to fall off the wall in our reproductive cells, but like an angel, telomerase is going to come in and replace that brick. And that's really kind of what's happening here. Telomerase comes along, and, and when the telomere gets shorter, telomerase relengthens the telomere and makes it long. So as a result, they don't get shorter. <clears throat> now, usually I show a lot of like proof of concept data at this point, but there's been so, such dramatic data in the last year. And by the way, uh, yesterday it was said that this data was eight to nine years ago. This is actually data that's just been the last year, maybe the last year and a half. But this, the first data that came out was Dr. Ron DePinnell, who's now the head of MD Anderson. Uh, he engineered mice to be able to turn the telomerase gene off and on again. Uh, he was actually one of the old proponents that the idea that, that turning on telomerase would cause cancer. And this is one of the reasons he was doing this experiment, was to look at these mice and show that turning on telomerase caused cancer. But he was able to engineer the mice so he had control over turning the telomerase gene on and off again. This is something we haven't figured out how to do in any other type of mice, and we haven't figured out how to do in humans. But he did it in these mice by creating this thing he did have control over. Well, the, the data in the press releases said telomerase reversed the aging process. That's the first time that there's ever been anything suggested like this. And Dr. Ron DePinnell was probably the last person in the world that would ever say this. But he is now saying this. And what I want to do now is I want to show just a short two-minute clip, Diane Sawyer interviewing Ron DePinnell. And it's not going. Do I need to click it again? No? Yes? Steve, is that? We did test this just before the talk, and it did work over on his computer. Where is my time clock? Can you go to the folder and just click on the video? Yeah, right there. Or try clicking on the other one, because... And now, eternal youth. Is it a cage around the corner? News Sorry. today of a breakthrough for some pioneering mice. But we always wonder, what does a fountain of youth for rodents reveal for humans? Here's Sharon Alfonsi reporting. I feel tremendous. In the movie Cocoon, it's a swimming pool that turns back the clock for a group of senior citizens. But now, researchers have found a way not just to stop, but reverse the aging process. 
The key is something called a telomere. We all have them. They're the tips or caps of your chromosome, seen here in yellow. This is what it looks like in a young adult. But as you grow older, the telomeres become damaged and frayed, and as they stop working, we start aging, experiencing things like hearing and memory loss. Scientists took mice who were prematurely aged, added an enzyme, and essentially turned their telomeres back on. You can see it before the enzyme, after. Their brain function improved, their fertility was restored. It was a, a remarkable uh, reversal of the aging process. Look at this picture. The mouse on the right has bad skin, gray hair, and is balding. But the one on the left had its telomeres flipped back on. And you can see that uh, essentially you now have a dark coat color, uh, that the hair uh, is restored, that the coat uh, has a nice healthy sheen to it. Even more dramatic, the change in brain size. This is before the mice had 75% of a normal brain, like a patient with severe Alzheimer's. But after the telomeres were reactivated, the brain returns to normal size. As for humans, while it is just one factor, scientists now say by looking at our blood cells and measuring those telomeres, you can get a better idea of how well you'll age. The longer the telomere, the better the chances for a more graceful aging. But as for tinkering with them and turning back our aging process, researchers say we still have a long way to go. Sharon Alfonsi, ABC News. Can you take me back to the presentation? Let's see, it's going to be a long ways. We're down to four minutes on my clock, and I've got at least ten minutes to go, so I'm going to have to go fast. I'll never understand why it takes only 20 minutes to do a talk in your room, but when you get here, it takes like an hour. Yeah, just a little higher. Yeah, why don't you just put it right there, and then I can just move forward from there. Oops, it went back to the beginning. Yeah, right there. Click on that one, that'll be fine. Oh, okay. Okay, <clears throat> so what I want to do, I'm running out of time really fast here, so I'm going to go fast. Maria Blasco, she was, Dr. Maria Blasco in Spain, she was one of the other people that was saying that telomerase would cause cancer. She's saying the exact opposite now. She's, she did gene therapy, this is just, this, just in the, this year, earlier this year, she published that she did gene therapy to insert telomerase into mice, and she saw the average lifespan span of uh, increase of 24%, if you can see that on the graphs there, I'm sorry, I'm not going to have time to explain the graphs in details, but she saw, in addition, she saw a maximum lifespan increase of about 13%. These are with mice that were treated when they were one year old. When she treated mice, oops, wrong way. When she treated mice that were two years old, she saw a 13% increase in the average lifespan and a 20% increase in the maximum lifespan. This is pretty exciting data. Saying that telomeres are doing something to increase the health of these mice and therefore increasing the lifespan of these and the health span of these mice. <clears throat> now, yesterday it was mentioned that sea anemones, uh, they, they are just a complete replacement of cells all the time and therefore it's irrelevant to talk to them about, talk about them, talk about them when talking about aging. But in fact, isn't that what we're trying to do with stem cell therapy? We are trying to use stem cells to replace all of our cells. And the same is true for telomere biology. What we're trying to do is we're trying to replace all of our cells so that we're made up of young cells. And that's something that an old truck doesn't have the ability to do. So the analogy of trying to say that we are old trucks and then just aging is the same way isn't exactly true because we have the ability to replace our tissues, replace our cells. Now, what, the way we're searching for telomerase inducers is the telomerase is produced by a gene. Uh, it's got a regulatory element next to that gene. Uh, in, that's in our reproductive cells, at least. In all of our normal cells, we have a repressor that is bound to the chromosome, shutting off that gene. 
So what the research that I'm doing at my company is we are trying to find drugs that will bind to this repressor and dislodge it oops, <clears throat> and turn on the telomerase gene. And what we have is robotic systems that will screen thousands of chemicals a week, <coughs> chemicals or natural products a week, searching for things like that. And we have found 39 different families of chemicals so far that will turn on the telomerase gene. We found about 900 different chemicals that have been broken down into 39 different families. And we're only about three years away from human testing with these chemicals, as, at least as soon as we find the funding to pay for it, to, to fund the research we need to do the, the testing. So we're getting pretty close. Now, but there's already natural products on the market. And what I want to do in the last minute and a half is kind of like just go through some of the clinical studies that are being done with these. There's really only one that's been published so far. But there's, a, there's been at least there's one, okay, first let me talk about study number one. This is a study that was done like five, six years ago with one of the natural products that are on the market. And there's a lot of different things that were looked at. We won't go into them because there was only one that was really statistically significant, and that was an improvement of the immune system. Okay, so we did see that their immune, or at least they saw that the, uh, uh, with this natural product, they did see an increase in the amount of, of lymphocytes that was in their cells, in their bodies. Okay, study number two. This is the published one. I'm an author on this, uh, looking at a natural product. I've blocked out the name here. Uh, but the, uh, uh, this, this showed, well, first of all, we showed that the, the cells do actually produce telomerase activity. And I wish I had time to explain this gel. Uh, <clears throat> but more importantly, we looked at the abundance of short telomeres. And we found out that 9 out of 10, 10 out of 12 people that were on this regimen actually saw a decrease in the number of short telomeres that they have. This is very statistically significant data. The, and surprisingly, the only two people that did not see a decrease in the abundance of short telomeres were number five and seven on this thing that already, where they had the shortest, the lowest number of short telomeres to begin with, which might not even have been measurable. So in 10 out of 12 people, they saw that the number of short telomeres actually decreased by taking a natural product telomerase inducer. Uh, here's a bunch of immune cells looked at. Again, we see a positive correlation, good, good results with the natural product uh, telomerase inducer. Um, <clears throat> I just, I'm just going to go through these really fast. These are things that were seen in a study and published. Study number three is not published yet, but I'm going to go through and say that this, the study is done. They saw all kinds of things. I'm, the light's flashing at me now. Okay, there's two clinical studies underway. Uh, there, they're going to be, the first studies were not placebo-controlled uh, studies. Okay, uh, this is now going to be a placebo-controlled study here. And this one's also going to be a placebo-controlled study, double-blind placebo-controlled, looking at, again, abundance of short telomeres. So we're lo really looking forward to that. Uh, the war has just begun. Now, I think that we've got a lot to do to actually fight this short telomere disease, but we're, on, we're making good progress. This is where I talked about publications. I have now, there's, I was asked to give a, a review on recent stuff that's occurred in telomere biology, but there's hundreds of papers of really exciting stuff that have been published this, this year. So I've kind of made an Excel sheet. And this website, if people want to go to this website, you can see the list, and I'm going to keep this updated, of just papers that have published in the last year. This is the same website's written on the top. It just shows I've got different categories, like does telomerase cause cancer, does it cause Alzheimer's disease, et cetera. I've checked them, and you can, if you look in the middle column, there's these blue lines. You can click on that, and you can actually go to the PubMed reference. So if you go to that, if anybody here is really interested in, in studying telomere biology and seeing what it's all about and want to see the hundreds of publications that come out every year, I'm keeping a record here just saving the last year's worth of publications. Okay, so you can also go to questions for Bill at yahoo.com. Thank you very much. <laughs>